think horses do an incredible job of biofeedback. They mirror and magnify our emotions and our nervous system back to us in real time. And so oftentimes there's this regulation that can happen when we work with horses. That's especially helpful after big plant medicine experiences. Heather Wickman, welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I am so excited to hear about your story, about how you were in corporate and how plant medicine found you, and now how you are working with other people to integrate these peak and spiritual awakening experiences, specifically with horses. Heather, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm excited Thanks. for the conversation. Absolutely. So let's just start with your background. Tell us a little bit about what you were doing before you were working with horses specifically for integration for plant medicine ceremonies. Yeah, this is kind of a, a crazy story. I always ask myself, like, how did this happen? So I'm a small town Minnesota kid who grew up with a, you know, a pretty narrow idea of what success looked like. And I followed that. So I, you know, everyone goes to college, they get a job, you know, they go to school, all those kind of things. And so I did the corporate climb. And spent probably 15 years in the corporate world, really striving for that sense of accomplishment, that sense of success. And it was always just eluding me. I just couldn't quite find it until I, I took a promotion to a job that I thought was going to be like my ultimate, my ultimate job, everything that I'd worked for. And there's this sinking, sinking feeling inside of me in terms of everyone around me was so excited. They were like, my God, you've worked so hard for this. This should your dream come true. And my mind was trying to wrap itself around that as well. Like, yes, of course. But there was this kind of soul sucking feeling. I'm sure you've encountered yeah. that at some point in your life. And at the end of the day, I couldn't take the job. And my husband was actually driving out to California because we were relocating for this job. And I called him and I'm like, babe, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm resigning today. Mm. And he's like, you're what? <laughs> So it was a little bit of a domino effect. He re resigned his corporate job. We basically sold everything we had and traveled for three months. So we went to Thailand and did really that eat, pray, love, trying to find ourselves and this new path. And that's when plant medicine found us, not necessarily in Thailand, but I was working with a coach on this transition. She's like, oh my God, you're my ayahuasca girl. Hmm. And I was like, what the hell's ayahuasca? <laughs> like I didn't have a clue. It wasn't a part of my communities. It wasn't a part of my growing up. And so literally had to Google ayahuasca. And as the universe does, it put me right in contact with an individual who runs retreats down in Mexico and met up with her. And a month later, my husband and I were down doing our first ayahuasca ceremony. And so that's kind of how we got introduced to plant medicine. And I've been working with plant medicines for about seven years now. And in the process of plant medicine, as it often does, it introduces you or helps you remember who you are. Mm -hmm. And that was it. That was very true for me. And that's how horses came back into my life. So I grew up with horses, had Zephyr Blue, my quarter horse, since I was like seven. And he passed away when I was 20. And a big part of me passed away with him. I just couldn't deal with the grief. And I didn't touch a horse for like a decade. No. And yeah, it was pretty crazy. And in one specific ayahuasca ceremony, it became very clear that horses were a huge part of who I am and the work that I'm here to do. And so that sent me on a huge journey of, I did a year and a half apprenticeship on equine facilitated coaching. I've worked with a couple other teachers. And so now I have blended kind of my, my background on leading transformational change, so executive coaching with plant medicine, as well as now working with horses to help individuals integrate their plant medicine experiences. That's amazing. So just a question about the ceremony if, and feel free not to answer if it's too personal <laughs> or anything, but I'd love to hear either for the listeners that have experienced an ayahuasca or any other plant mes medicine ceremony and can kind of relate or for people listening that haven't experienced ayahuasca and are interested. Either way, it's, it's fascinating to hear other stories, and that's part of our own integration and in learning and growing. You mentioned that horses are a big part of who you are. Was there something specific that came through in the ceremony that really helped you remember this? Yeah. 
so that might have been, I don't know, two or three, maybe years into our work with ayahuasca. I had a ceremony where these are always a little bit tough to explain, but we were in a maloca, which is like an outdoor ceremonial space. And halfway through the ceremony, I, I, you know, kind of opened my eyes and it wasn't obviously my, my literal vision, but, and I saw 12 horses surrounding us in the maloca or surrounding me in the maloca. And they kept on saying, you have horse medicine, you have horse medicine, you have horse medicine, you have horse medicine. And this literally went on for the entire ceremony in terms of that was the phrase that I kept on hearing and feeling and like, we've been waiting for you. And it was just this crazy sensation of like, I don't know what you want from me and I don't know what horse medicine is. <laughs> and so that was a really beautiful, but jarring kind of experience. It was so potent from an emotional experience as well as a, a visceral kind of I mean, a full body experience of these horses like huffing right over my shoulder. And so I, I go home and I know enough about plant medicine at that time that not everything is literal. right? And so there's a metaphorical element to all of this. And I was like, OK, do they want me to be a vet? Am I supposed to be a vet? <laughs> I was in this like trying to figure out who I am space. And it wasn't a vet. I did a little bit of a Google search and I ran across equine assisted learning at that point. And though that kind of a shockwave goes through your body. You're like, oh, God, of course. Where have I been? And so ended up finding a, a teacher here locally that I was able to work with. And now horses, oh, my God, they show up in almost every ceremony that I do. It's pretty incredible. It's amazing. And tell us a little bit about the horse medicine that you're sharing with others. I know you mentioned their vibration and their healing and great for integration, but could you go a layer deeper on that? Yeah. I like to say that there's kind of a scientific approach or side to this work, and then there's a very spiritual side to this work. And I'll start with the scientific side in that I think horses do an incredible job of biofeedback. And so when I say that, I mean, they mirror and magnify our emotions and our nervous system back to us in real time. And so oftentimes when we're not even aware of where we're at emotionally or where our nervous systems are at, if we're flight, fright, fight, freeze, dissociated, wherever we might be. And so oftentimes there's this regulation that can happen when we work with horses. That's especially helpful after big plant medicine experiences, because if folks are anything like me, we get kind of blown out of the water and then we have to bring the pieces back home. And so mm -hmm. horses can really help us make sense of what are the emotions that I'm feeling right now and how do I settle my nervous system? There's also this coherence element that happens there is an electromagnetic field that is created in ourselves as well as horses. So in ourselves, it's about the size of our arms around us. And in horses, it's about five times bigger than that. And so horses' natural state is in coherence, meaning it's in harmony. And they can kind of entrain humans and so help us kind of find the coherence within our systems again so that we can find clarity and make good decisions. But in the coherent space, it's also about authenticity. You can't be around a horse, really, if you are telling yourself lies. Horses are prey animals, and so they detect that really easily as threats. And so if we interact with horses authentically, they engage with us. If we interact with them with masks and lies, they disengage from us. Again, which is a really great teaching moment in terms of working with horses after plant medicine. And the last one I would say from a scientific perspective, it's, it's really this inside out approach working with horses. It's somatic, it's experiential. You're diving into how does your body feel when you're working with your horse and what is the body telling you versus kind of your mind trying to make sense of it. And then from a spiritual side, this is kind of the side that I'm most intrigued by because it's, it's not all that well documented and it's hard to describe if you haven't experienced it firsthand. But I would say they really teach us the language of the heart in that we can communicate best with horses and sense into horses best from our hearts. And they really teach us how to see through the felt perception of our hearts. And that's been something that I've been working on ever since I've been working with horses. The other one is they're like provocative adversaries. They're like our greatest soul friends, but also like huge pain in the asses sometimes in terms of 
they're going to push you and challenge you for you to be able to see your edges and to see your growth spots. So if you've ever worked with a horse, you know that they can be super stubborn and all these kind of things. And oftentimes they're pushing you to be able to see something different. And lastly, I would say kind of this idea of messengers and illuminators. I've had the experience and I have the full belief that horses can take you on a waking journey similar to plant medicine. And they can bring messages in and illuminate intuition and kind of deep knowing in ways that I don't think we have in everyday experiences. And that's probably been the most profound work that I've personally had with horses is in that space of kind of direct knowing. Yeah, this sounds amazing because I know in my experience in working with plant medicines, the most powerful thing for me is getting outside, getting with the elements or connecting yeah. with my dog or, you know, maybe it's pal boring and asking to see some dolphins and then dolphins come through and, right. yeah, you know, just you're, you're tapped in for lack of a better way to put it. But yeah, I've definitely experienced that firsthand from animals directly, but not with horses. So yeah. I'm curious how you facilitate these experiences for people. Yeah, you know, they're, they're really pretty custom. And so we have folks come to our property here and work with the horses over the course of three days. And it might be, you know, we're working with the horses in the morning and then take a break and do some hiking or in the afternoon and the morning's spent kind of more digesting those kind of things. But the horses really help us understand what we need to do. And it's taken me some time to really trust that process. But we may be well, where I should start primarily is the horses pick who they want to work with. Mm. And so we have someone potentially in our round pen or in our arena, kind of in the center of the pen and holding their intention on the thing that they want to work with or the thing they want to make sense of. And we let our horses loose at liberty, meaning they don't have halters or lead ropes on. And we get them moving. And at one point, one horse will start engaging with that person. And then we know that person and that horse are the ones that need to begin to work together. And from there, we generally kind of let it go where it needs to go. We might do some reflective work where we do some blindfolded grooming. And so when you take away the sight wow, of an that's individual, cool. yeah, amazing things happen when you can tap into the energy and the breath and the, the being of that horse in that intimate space. We might do just some. Do a meditation with the horse, go on a walk with the horse, all those kind of things. Or we could do more active work as if the individual is working kind of through a very tangible challenge, like a big career transition or a big decision. And through an obstacle course, we have different kind of stations and those stations can represent different kind of challenges that would be in the way as it relates to that scenario. And the horse usually tells us along the way kind of where the challenges need to be. So that's kind of a, a little sampling of some of the things that we might do. Yeah, it reminds me of Avatar, you know, when they let them loose with, I forget what they're called. They're kind of like dragons and uh, they choose them and then they tether themselves to the flying dragon type creature. You know what I'm talking about? I've never seen it, but you're the second person that said, oh my God, you have to watch the Avatar movie. Oh, you got to watch it. I remember after the first time I did ayahuasca, I was like, oh, Avatar was about ayahuasca. And then and like it totally was in so many different ways. And obviously it's about a lot of things, but their connection to the earth and okay. the way they even call it Iowa. Awa, I think they call it Awa. That's like the element that they're so connected to. And, you know, Aya, right? And then the way they're connected to it, there's all kinds of stuff. And huh. then- Years later, I saw a deleted scene where it's an ayahuasca vision that the main character has that didn't oh, make wow. it to the final cut. So there you go. And it had some other elements like I forget what it was other elements from other medicines in it. They kind of like made their own thing. It wasn't like just ayahuasca. Right. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, my dad bred hit one of our dogs and then he bred another. And the first one there was a puppy that just like gravitated towards me and that and being the one that I kept. And they always say like the puppy chooses you when you go yeah. choose a puppy. And yeah. it, it definitely felt like that. I still have her now. She's not in the room right now. Her name's Riley. But <laughs> anyways, yeah, that's that's awesome. That sounds really cool. And I like the idea of taking away one of the senses to heighten yeah. the other word ones and especially vision. That makes sense. Yeah which oftentimes happens in ayahuasca anyways, right? It's, it's yeah. pitch black. <laughs> Absolutely. Very cool. So shifting gears a little bit, you mentioned that you do executive coaching with plant medicine. What does that look like? 
Yeah, this is something that's relatively new in the making. So I've done a ton of executive coaching, you know, kind of transitioning out of my corporate career. And I've had a lot of success in that space. And it dawned on me that this is a fantastic modality to kind of work alongside psychedelic medicine. And so it's a three or six month engagement, very similar to like a traditional coaching package that you might do. But it's all around working through your insights of plant medicine. So you do the plant medicine experience early in that engagement. So in the first month, for example, and then we spend the three and six months, three or six months, really diving into that experience personally. And how do you weave change into your life that you kind of got out of your experience? Because the thing that I, I find so much through my own experiences, as well as colleagues' experience with plant medicine is, you know, you have these pivotal insights and then you don't know how to bring them home. You don't know how to make them real in your life. And then you, they just go and do another plant medicine ceremony mm -hmm. and you end up getting kind of the same message over and over and over again until you really find a way to integrate it. So this is kind of our solution to that, this psychedelic guided executive coaching that we really kind of work with clients to make sure that they integrate that change, weave those changes into the habits and decisions of their everyday life. Yeah, that resonates with me deeply. The book I wrote earlier this, this year is called Soul Life Balance, A Guide to Ignite uh, and Integrating cool. Spiritual Awakenings. Yeah, it's all about that because you're so right. What we do oftentimes when we first find this, this world of ceremony, whether or not you've had experience with psychedelics recreationally or not, we typically go and find a more ceremonies and we're jumping from ceremony to ceremony and we haven't fully integrated. So hearing from you, working with executives with this three to six month program, like what are the type of pillars and content that you're going over in these six months? Yeah. So that's a fantastic question. And it kind of morphs given what the individual is going through. And so Oftentimes it's an element of just kind of grounding. So how do we ground the experience? So there might be some pillars around breath work. There might be some yoga. There might be some body movement, all those kind of things to kind of help your body settle into the experience. We do also a bunch of meditation kind of stuff in those spaces. But there's also very kind of tactical elements. We use a coaching process called immunity to change. Hmm. And it helps uncover the hidden commitments that we have like think of them as like the safety mechanisms that we have in our brain that keep us from doing stupid shit. And so we have to kind of surface those and make sense of those and then create tiny habits to undo those. And so right. there's a lot of work with some of those coaching models and then tiny habits and then different kind of skill building. But oftentimes they're around, you know, making big, like I said, career transitions, big, mm -hmm. de yeah. big decisions in your life maybe leaving an organization or starting a new organization. So we tend to tailor it around those things as well. Yeah. You know, that's one of the staples of loss for words right now are just blanking, but yeah, that's one of the common things with the plant mess and ceremonies, like a career transition. It's usually like 90% of the time, it seems like. <laughs> and it was definitely for me. And so right, my story same. resonates for a lot of folks in that space. Yeah, my story is super similar to your serial entrepreneur named Silicon Valley's 40 under 40 like oh, things nice. and then just burnt out from chasing right. success and then being mm -hmm. like, okay, show me, blinders on with spirituality. And yeah, right now I'm working as a keynote speaker, speaking in corporate settings as well, talking Fantastic. about bringing mental health into the workplace through the practice of soul life balance. And it's so funny because in my book, it goes very deep with like integrating like plant medicine experiences. And then after writing the book, thinking about like, oh, how can I really be that bridge and, and help people the yeah. best? It's like corporate audience. <laughs> oh, wait, now I can't use any of the content from my book. And it's funny because just recently I spoke at an HR conference and I'd led like a three minute, maybe it was three minutes, maybe five short visualization, slight breath work. And you could see tears in people's eyes. Yeah, and absolutely. I, it, and it, it's funny though, like because the deep work that we do with plant medicine and everything else, sometimes yeah. I forget about how this other stuff that, you know, seems to me like kind of like just not surface, but, you beginner. know, we've gone so much deeper. Yeah, beginner. And it's like, oh, well, you got to meet people where they're at, right? 
So with these executives that you're bringing it back to that, these executives, are you bringing it into like the workplace or are you just working on them a personal level? And then how does that look in terms of them being executives and leaders and how's that yeah. transition if they are staying in their current career or transitioning yeah. out with the employees and workplace culture? Yeah. So right now I am working with the individual. And so I'm not bringing it into organizations, although I love that idea. And I've read some articles about how some entrepreneurs are bringing their team, you know, down to do some ayahuasca ceremonies and developing organizational vision around what they see in those ceremonies. So that could be on the forefront at some point. But at this point, working with the individual and the thing that I'm most intrigued by is you know, what happens because of these experience in the organization's culture, in the organization's mission, in their bottom line, but also in just the community that they exist. Because I do think the, these medicines have the potential to transform how we work and how we engage with one another from a place of love mm -hmm. versus this place of competition and fear and, you know, coercion and control it which is oftentimes what we see in most organization, organizational cultures. And so I'm like wildly inspired to, to work with entrepreneurs, C CEOs, different kinds of executives who are truly willing to do the work themselves, mm -hmm. knowing that it's going to impact everyone around them, meaning this whole organizational system is really fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally agree. If you can work with the leader and they can make the changes in there. And that's what's so hard, right? Because there's personal stuff as well as yeah. work and everything else. But in terms of integration, because you work with them in this three, six month program. What is and I'm, I'm might not ask this the best way, but like, what is one of the bigger things that often comes up in terms of resistance to quote unquote doing the work of integration that you see with people across the board? Ooh, OK, man, <laughs> this might sound really simple, but it's making different choices. Mm. And so, you know. We can say we want something all day, every day. And we want something to be different. And this is what it needs to look like. But it requires that you make a different choice, a choice that you didn't make yesterday, a choice to, you know, lead differently, choose a different priority, whatever it might be. And by making that different choice, it disrupts all sorts of things. It, uh, it disrupts an individual themselves because it oftentimes goes against what they believed might be believed who they were, their identity, their reputation, but then it kind of bumps up against everyone around them because they're like, hey, that's not actually how you normally show up. And so why are you being so different here? And so it's kind of a, a high level answer to your question. But, you know, at the, the end of the day, a, a coach, a guide, a therapist can only do, can only help and support you to the level in which you're willing to move, you know? And so at the end of the day, that, that where we bump up against the most resistance is making new and different choices. 100%. And that can be one of the hardest places to be, whether you're quote unquote coach, guide, friend, anything right. at right. all, seeing or thinking you see what a, a quote unquote solution might be. And just the person doesn't want to do it for whatever reason. So yeah. your experience in being a coach, how do you guide these people to push past that resistance yeah. that comes up. So the immunity to change process is really helpful in that because we can surface why they don't want to change. And it usually comes back to some kind of core belief around it's not going to be safe if I do this. And from there, we do safe to try experiments. And that's really been the key in terms of, you know, I'm not asking someone to make this giant leap tomorrow that's going to kind of completely disrupt who they are in the organization. But I am going to ask them to do, to start in a safe to try place. Like where can you begin to try to do something different and see what happens? And more often than not, you know, their worst fear doesn't even come close to happening. Mm -hmm. And it gives them the confidence to be like, okay, maybe I can try it in a little bigger scenario. And so we work more in incremental steps than these kind of like big, bold steps. Some people are okay with those big, bold steps, but a lot of people are like, you need to walk with me a little bit more slowly on this path. Yeah, I think a, a, a big part of it, to your point, is kind of personality type. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, for sure, like after the first ayahuasca experience, I changed 
everything in my life. And that's kind of <laughs> like it, who I am, my personality yeah. type. And it became so clear in the medicine ceremony too, that I was like, well, what's the point of doing this ceremony if I'm not actually going to act yeah. on it? Yeah. And then past three years in bouncing from one ceremony to the other and integrating and not integrating and, mm -hmm. and experiencing psychic attacks and dark entities and yeah. all these type of things, it became very confusing at a certain point for when I'm in a medicine ceremony, what becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in the mm -hmm. integration as opposed to yes, I experienced this thing and this is what came through. How do I best use my discernment to delineate what the difference is between my ego, another being that may not be benevolent mm -hmm. and what is truth? Because oftentimes it hasn't happened so much with me because I, I do feel like I have pretty good discernment, mm -hmm. but I do see it with so many people where it's like, I experienced this in a medicine ceremony. Now, this is ultimate truth, and I'm going to act this way, which that doesn't align with my belief system. So I'm curious if you have thoughts there. Yeah. So it's kind of a fascinating thing. And, and let me know if this is kind of a train. We oftentimes are around folks who, you know, the medicine told me that I need to be a shaman, right? Or I need to be. <laughs> That's a like 100% no, uh, of the time almost, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's kind of this fascinating conversation of like, okay. Like, let's go and unpack that a little bit to see what might be truth. And I think your your point around discernment is so important and so hard to teach mm -hmm. because it takes some experience with working with the plant medicine to realize like, oh, like you are deciphering from an ego perspective to like a truth perspective. And it takes a little bit of practice and people around you who are going to speak some truth or uh, their truth, at least a perspective of truth to you to be able to help you. And so... In those situations, I never try to be like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Everyone says that. I, I more like we dive really deep and, and it usually is some kind of a metaphor to them taking back power in their life. Mm -hmm. And so that is my perspective in terms of like, there is some, <laughs> there is some work to do in terms of cultivating what actually comes through in some of the ceremonies. Yeah, I'll stop there. And I, I feel like working with the horses, going back to the work that you do would yeah. be a, a great integration because it kind of gets you out of that monkey chatter mind. And this is often what happens with integration. It's like, okay, I'm going to go back into my lifestyle. I'm going to go back into my home environment. And maybe I did or didn't meditate or journal or do yoga or do breath or, or the traditional type of things, right? Mm -hmm. But now I'm going to be more diligent with those things but you're not actually making real changes. It, right. It's like you tell yourself I'm angry because I'm doing these things, yeah. but you're not actually like acting on something after you use your discernment or not, or doing like the, the bigger thing of going to Colorado, visiting you with the horses or, you know, going on adventures that you've wanted to do or exploring and getting yeah. out of your comfort zone, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And the horses, like I mentioned previously, you can't lie to a horse. Mm -hmm. And or you can, but you're going to see the immediate reaction in the horse. And so, you know, in those situations, it can be very frustrating for an individual when they're like, I'm supposed to be a shaman. And you try to interact with the horse and the horse flees from you. Like, OK, that version of the truth is probably not the right one that you receive from the medicine. And then mm -hmm. it's kind of boiling that down to really understand, like, what does this mean? And so. Absolutely. And then it's kind of my husband always says, like, well, life is medicine. Yeah. yeah, these these plants are fantastic, but life is going to show up and give you all sorts of things that you need to work with to try to make sense of that. And so, you know, you have friends who go down the shamanic path and then drop out three months down the road. And, you know, life is medicine there in terms of like, OK, I guess that wasn't actually true. Yeah, no, that's a good point. This whole human experience is definitely a ceremony within yeah. itself. Yeah, <laughs> it's I love it. Well, Heather, this is awesome. And what is the best place for people to connect with you and learn more about how to work with you at Untethered and the horses or your coaching program or anything else? Yeah. So you can find me online at www.beuntethered.c. And you can also find me on LinkedIn and Instagram at Heather Wickman, PhD. Heather Wickman, P what was it? PhD. PhD. We didn't even talk about your PhD. That's okay. <laughs> I'm like, oh, cool. 
Well, this is awesome. Uh, I'm excited to for people to hear this podcast. I do have friends in Colorado. I'm in California. And just anyone listening, whether you're near the state, whether you're in this country, another question, a country, if you're interested at all in this, I highly do recommend connecting with Heather, checking it out for yourself th- or just finding another avenue that works yeah. for you to integrate. So I think this Absolutely. is this is awesome what you're doing, Heather. I commend you for getting out of corporate culture and having your PhD and getting something that actually <laughs> beats your soul. So Absolutely. Yeah. This is awesome. Thanks so much, Heather. Thank you.